I'm happy to be the, uh, the lunchtime nap position, so I hope I, hope I don't <laughs> make anyone go to sleep. Um, I'll just jump right into it. Um, between 2013 and 2016, I spent about 16 to 17 months um, doing ethnographic fieldwork among Chinese migrant entrepreneurs, mostly traders, and employees, and the people, Tanzanians, with whom they interacted with in Dar es Salaam, um, Tanzania. Um, thanks. And followed in 2018 by a month I did of research I did in China with people who had gone back home. Um, my research was focused primarily on the semiotics of everyday, oh, sorry, okay, of everyday interactions, um, and particularly the relationship between experiences that people had and how they talked about these experiences, how they represented these experiences. And what I've published so far has been mostly based on close studies of particular kinds of interactions, or more broadly, how these kinds of interactions are interpreted by my interlocutors as representative of the larger global relationship. For example, how Chinese and Tanzanians greet or don't greet each other on the street, and what happens in interactions when Tanzanian street-level bureaucrats solicit or receive bribes from Chinese migrants. And how I frame my um, larger project, how I frame my larger project is an examination of how um, the life projects of Chinese migrants and ordinary Tanzanians have become interdependent in the context of um, political economic relations between them, and how both people make sense of the China-Africa relationship through the ethical evaluation of their social interactions. Um, and, but today, my talk's a little bit different. Um, I talk about the politics of shifting trade hierarchies around the import and distribution of Chinese-produced consumer goods in the wholesale market of Karyako Dar es Salaam, which is the uh, commercial capital of Tanzania. And this is based on a long descriptive chapter from my dissertation that I, I don't know what to do with. And so I'm trying to like figure out what to do with this large chapter. And that's, so this isn't really like a full paper. It's sort of a paper in the process of being cooked, so to speak, um, processed. Um, I'm not a political economist. And so I didn't really set out to study supply chains or value chains. That wasn't my project. But in the process of doing field work with traders, obviously, um, a story did emerge, um, especially among my Tanzanian interlocutors, about shifting hierarchies of trade in the marketplace as a result of Chinese goods and Chinese traders. Now, my motivation for doing this paper has been to think how to tell the story. Now, I'm not the first person to write about how Chinese commodities have affected local, hier local trade hierarchies. And on the surface, what I describe in Tanzania can be found elsewhere. I don't really have anything new in terms of, of the, um, the, ev the evidence on the ground. My goal is not to replicate the great work that's already being done on the ethnography of supply chains by those like Heidi Haugen, who's doing some of the best work on this right now, or even um, Gordon Matthews and his team, um, who did some of that. Instead, I want to try, what I, my goal is to try to bring new questions and perspectives to the political economy of China Africa. So I'm using my case study more as like a, a point of entry for me to enter a conversation rather than sort of to bring new evidence per se. And my questions concern how the political economy of relations between Africa and China are conceptualized, how they're felt, how they're known, and how they're narrated, and how these concepts and narratives are expressed in different genres, whether it's a rumor on the street or a scholarly monograph, for example. Now, why is this important? Um, in the literature on global China, but also China-Africa, is often remarked that there's a gap between different narratives of how we imagine. I mean, this morning there was a talk about a negative story about China versus a positive story. I mean, that's one example. But in the China-Africa literature, um, a lot of the scholars try to position themselves as myth busters, sort of to bust myths about China and Africa. Um, one of these myths is the idea of the Chinese petty trader, you know, the Chinese trader on the street selling potatoes, um, which is sort of this figure um, um, and, some, uh, and some early scholars who talked about Chinese traders in Africa often treated these accounts as straightforward stories. So there's some very kind of breathless accounts of Chinese traders taking over the entire marketplace. It's kind of a hyperbolic narrative one finds in some early reports. Um, others dismissed these kinds of rumors as, oh, they're just myths. Um, we're, we're, I mean, too bad uh, Barry Salomon's not here today, but Barry Salomon and Yen Hai Rong had written about these myths as sort of politically motivated. Um, and so what I'm trying to do instead is I'm trying to trace the relationship between political economic changes and how these changes are known by people in particular locations, how they're misrecognized, how they're experienced, and how they're narrated. 
Um, and so I spent a lot of my time in a wholesale market. And one of the things that struck me being in a wholesale market is that even though there's a discourse about industrialization that accompanies Chinese investment, the idea that um, Chinese investors are investing in areas that Western capital has not um, in, in Africa. Um, uh, it's what I was confronted with on a day-to-day -day basis was just a sort of massive amount of Chinese goods. And when I would, and the thing is, there are Chinese factories being built in Tanzania. Um, Seventy percent of registered businesses, in fact, are involved in manufacturing, at least on paper. But traders I would talk to, Tanzanians would insist that was not true, and they were very, very adamant that it was not true. And they would say, well, what, is, what are all these goods here? <laughs> Look, there's goods everywhere. Oh, but I've been to the factories. No, 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 it's not a real factory. That's a secret warehouse. And so there's, there's a sort of time lag in which the results are not seen in the present. And so I sort of see what I'm doing as sort of occupying this strange temporality um, where in some ways Chinese presence in a place like Tanzania is seen either as an epilogue of a long historical pattern in which um, African countries are on the periphery of the global economy as you know, suppliers of raw materials and as importers of consumer goods. And so from this perspective, what the Chinese do is seen as another iteration of an older pattern. You know, it used to be um, Western products, now it's Chinese products. However, there's another sort of narrative that is actually, you no, know, this is a prologue of something completely different. Um, that this is stage one, as one person described to me, and that soon there'll be factories, soon with roads being constructed, there'll be takeoff. And this is the narrative of people like uh, Justin Lin, from, you know, formerly of the World Bank, who's argued that you know, these Chinese manufacturing jobs are going to migrate to Africa. And, so, and because in this sort of an ethnographic context, you can't predict the future, you're kind of stuck in this sort of space in which everything seems possible because you don't quite know how things will turn out. And in a lot of the literature on um, China-Africa and sort of its impact on development, um, there's a certain tense, a way that these th things are talked about. So, for example, I've, I've noticed a lot of articles that I read, um, read that will often make the argument, the conclusion is often very similar. It's that if African states do a series of things, i.e. reduce transaction costs, um, if they handle corruption, if they improve infrastructure, if, 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 if they do these good things, then Chinese investment represents an opportunity for development. And so that seems to be often a lot of conclusion that Chinese development is neither good or bad, it depends on the African states. But that is a certain perspective which, it's different from a kind of an historical perspective. When once history has happened, you kind of have to deal with what's developed. And so it's kind of an interesting way that different perspectives on China-Africa have to take a different position in relationship to sort of time and sort of where, where they're looking, what is immediately ahead of them. Um, so what, let me see. So um, what I wanted to do with this paper was I was trying to force myself to read the literature on, um, on, uh, on, on trade flows between um, China and Tanzania. And one of the concepts that you know, I encounter is this idea of value capture, the idea of you know, who, who profits from the movement of commodities and, and goods from uh, China, China to Africa. And often the consensus is that this is not a a sector that which leads to productive growth, unless it's you know, accompanied by the movement of capital goods, by the development of, of industries. Um, but there's another perspective, and also because the kinds of jobs that are created by this trade are often what gets called you know, the informal economy. You know, Chinese goods come in, um, they're sold by wholesalers, they're distributed to street traders, and there's a lot of people who are sort of indirectly employed by this. But there's a different perspective on informal economies, which has recently been argued by the anthropologist James Ferguson, who argues that if you look at a lot of urban economies in, in urban Africa, it's that most people are not involved in what you know, he calls like productive activities, you know, value-added activities, but often engage in um, what he says, whose fundamental purpose is not to produce goods at all, but to engineer distributions of goods produced elsewhere by accessing or making claims on the resources of others. And he describes petty trade, for example, as, as a contingent livelihood. That is, it's not really about entrepreneurship, it's really about making opportunities from a whatever um, shrinking source of livelihood. Now, Ferguson's larger project is to rethink development. Um, he's skeptical about the possibilities for industrialization, and sort of his larger project is to try to argue for the need to do cash, um, direct cash transfers. 
Now, I, there are a number of problems that can be raised with Ferguson, um, one of which is that you know, popular imaginations, especially among Tanzanians I talk to, is still about industry. They don't want to be traders. They want jobs in, in, in factories. But one of the benefits of Ferguson's um, approach is it raises the question of how different economic actors conceptualize ideas like market, conceptualize ideas like value, and even ideas like interest. And going back to uh, Marcel Mauss, you know, who argues that exchange is not just about economics, it's also about politics, it's also about morality at the same time as it is e economic. Um, so you know, just give an example to so different forms of you know, value capture um, in the process of moving goods from China to Africa. Um, can we conceive of them as sort of pilferage? Can we see them as rightful shares, you know, people taking an extra bonus for themselves? Um, corruption versus sort of um, tips. Do we see middlemen as getting in the way of more direct relations? Or do we see them as brokers who are facilitating? You see the, 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 that division in the literature. Um, but let me just. But what, I'm, but what I'm trying to do is, in, is look at how the movement of goods from China to Africa involves an, a wide number of actors. And in this slide, I just have an example of just some of the people who are involved in this massive labor of, of distribution and sort of how, and how they, how they um, get their rightful share from that. But um, basically, this paper I'm trying to present has gone through several iterations. And what I want to do is I want to sort of focus on how different actors make claims on, on wealth. And um, what I'm talking about today refers specifically to the way that hierarchy in the marketplace is imagined. And in Tanzania, historically, who is a trader, who is a wholesaler, and who is a, who's a retailer has been conceptualized often in ethnicized and racialized terms. And so to get to the specifics of the case I'm presenting, I want to talk about how the entrance of Chinese traders and Chinese commodities sort of reconfigured these hierarchies and what that might say about the way people sort of imagine about who has a right to participate in different parts of, of, of the economy, if, 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 that, if that's clear. Um, so this talk is not so much about sort of the, the Chinese perspective, but more about the way that the emergence of Chinese traders in Tanzania was experienced by uh, Tanzanian traders. One of you know, the stories of the Chinese coming in the thing is, in, in Tanzania, um, until the early 1990s, importing of foreign commodities was tightly controlled under the, uh, under the socialist system. And when it was liberalized in the early 1990s, some of the earliest um, people who became wholesalers were mostly um, Indians who have had a long history of migration on the East African coast and have long been in that position of being a middleman trader. And so one of the interesting narratives that I heard talking to Tanzanians was that <laughs> the Chinese sort of, un, sort of liberated the Tanzanians from the monopoly of Indians and Arab traders. And um, you know, one of my informants even described it as liberation. It was like when the, when the Chinese came, they were liberators. Um, and what did they liberate them from was specifically um, offering goods for cheaper prices than had been the case with, the, um, with, with Indian traders. Now, there's an obvious explanation for this, which is simply you know, competition, right? Competition lowered prices. But what's interesting is that often the people do not explain in, term of, in terms of competition. They explain in terms of different ethnicized ways of doing business. And so the story in Tanzania is that if you're a Tanzanian and you go to an Indian shop and ask for, you know, I want this type of shoe, um, they will call, this is the story people tell, oh, they'll call all the other Indian shops and they'll all agree on the price and then um, you won't be able to get a deal. But the idea is that the Chinese do business differently, is that the Chinese will compete against their own family. And so, um, and, and this is interesting because Chinese traders themselves would bring this up as why they did not have Tuanjie. You know, this was like, you know, like the Indians and the Arabs, you know, they, they, they work together, but why us Chinese, we don't, we destroy, we destroy the market for each other. And so it was an interesting way in which the idea of how people did business was ethnicized. Um, now, but it cannot, but this change cannot just be attributed to the um, Chinese. And I think what's important is to realize when we talk about sort of the entry of Chinese capital or Chinese goods, we have to look at the local context. And so uh, when Chinese commodities became available in the marketplace in Tanzania, there was already changes happening within local wholesale trading hierarchies. And so for example, um, 
there were merchants, migrants from northern Tanzania from a group called the Chaga who began to migrate into the city in the 1980s. And first they began to buy goods from the Indian traders, and then they accumulated capital, and then they began to go into wholesaling themselves. And then many of them were the, some of the first Tanzanians to go to Dubai and then to Guangzhou to, you know, to, to source directly from, from China. Um, and what's interesting is the way they were able to undermine the, the position of the Indians. Um, as one uh, Indian trader explained to me, he said, you know, we Indians are expensive. And what he meant by that is, you know, that their cost of living were higher. But he said, you know, but the Chaga, they, they live very cheaply, you know. So because we could not live at their level, um, they were able to sort of take over the market. And now we are the same. And this was a phrase that often came up a lot in my fieldwork, is people saying, we are now all the same. Sometimes it was kind of neutral, saying, you know, there used to be divisions, but now we're the same. Sometimes it was critical. So they would say, the Chinese, they're doing the same thing we are doing. We are all the same. This is an idea that different people had different positions. And there is all this kind of being fl um, thrown into flux, not just because of the Chinese, but the Chinese represent one part of that um, story. And, and I'm going to kind of rush through because I don't have a lot of time. But basically, what I want to talk about is how um, the way people talk about the Indian traders vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese, you get two kinds of narratives. And so some people say that you know, the Chinese are closer to us than the Indians. The Indians are very proud. They don't give goods on credit. They don't trust us. But the Chinese, they're willing to give goods on credit. They're willing to learn the local language. They're willing to joke around with us. Um, so for some, the Chinese are more closer to the Tanzanians, more intimate than the Indians. But you talk to a different set of traders, and they say, no, 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 no. You know, the Indians are already part of us. You know, they live here. They, their money goes into property here. Their money doesn't go back to China. Uh, the Indians taught us how to do trade. The Chinese are just here to destroy business. And you find, of course, that who's saying what depends on their own sort of personal narrative of how they entered the market. And so um, Tanzanian African traders who entered the, entered the wholesale trading before the mid-2000s um, had usually very negative views of the Chinese, because for them, they had mobility. They were the ones going to Guangzhou. They were the ones going to Dubai. And they said, well, you know, the Chinese, they don't want us to be there. This is as one man said to me. They don't want us to be there. They want us to be here. And so, you know, lack of mobility was not just about socioeconomic mobility. It was about sort of geographical mobility as well. But for um, Tanzanian traders who got involved in trade after the mid-2000s is a very different story, is the Chinese brought opportunities. You didn't have to travel to Guangzhou to buy goods cheap. You could buy them right down the street. And so a lot of the petty traders were very, very appreciative of the Chinese because they said, you know, they have brought opportunities and they're above us. Again, going back to this, this, this language of above, above, below, they said, you know, they're above us. They don't compete at our, at our level. Now, um, let's see, one, one minute left. So, um, so I'm not going to have time to talk about everything, but if I had time, well, one of the things I would also talk about is how the, the stories people tell about who did what, who, in, who invaded the market or not, often, asserts, often ascribes agency to Chinese that doesn't actually quite match the actual, the actual um, unfolding of the market. I could talk about that in the Q&A. But what I, what I get to is how there was, a, there was an implicit moral order that people had about who should do what. So it wasn't like opposition to the Chinese saying there should be no Chinese here. It was like, yes, we want the Chinese, but they should not be opening shops next to us. They should have wholesale shops near the airport so there's a distance. Because if there's distance, there's concealment. And if there's concealment, there's markup. If the wholesale shop's there, a customer can compare the market price, and then, then they can you know, negotiate down. Oh, no, the Chinese should build factories. So it wasn't really about the Chinese, but about your position in the marketplace. And there's, a very, and there's a discourse within Tanzania about the position one is in the marketplace. And sort of the larger point I'm trying to extrapolate from this is sort of the question of the roles people play. And I think it's one dimension of the so-called China in the world we don't quite talk about as much as sort of how we imagine what, a, what Chinese capital is. What are they in those particular places? How, what is considered to be an advantageous position? What's considered to be a disadvantageous position? And I could talk a little bit more about how that I think affects the way we look at theorizing China Africa more broadly. But because time's up, I don't want to take it up, so I'll just end there. Thank you.